Hi, my name is Richard Cole, and I'm giving a talk on how do you scale up social enterprises today, um, with a particular focus on developing countries. Can I have the next slide? So uh, we're going to go over four things. We'll first talk about some uh, key uh, concepts, and then definitions, how to do a scaling up strategy, challenges and how to meet them, and if we have time, we'll get to the conclusions. Next slide. So, um, a little bit dense, but what I wanted to talk about here is, first of all, you need a scaling up strategy. Um, there's a lot of, depending upon what kind of program you're working with, often, particularly people who are targeting programs that they expect to design and integrate into government, they kind of think that just once they do it, the government somehow magically will pick it up and implement it, and it doesn't work that way. But even if that's not your implementation strategy, um, there are, uh, it's a good to have a scaling up strategy as early as possible, and most of this talk is going to be how to design one. And the earlier you do that, the better. I think once you've got proof that this intervention is going to work, uh, you've got some sort of proof of concept, you pilot it, at least at a small scale, um, that is the time uh, to develop a strategy. Um, if you don't do that, you tend to suffer from one of the following breakdowns. Uh, first of all, um, you often don't match your costs with what the feasible budget constraint is. And again, this can be for whatever type of model you're working with, whether it's a service that you're going to sell on the market if you're a true social enterprise, um, does that meet capacity to pay the price you're going to charge? And can you cover your costs at something that's affordable? In particular, if you're targeting the poor in developing countries, obviously uh, capacity to pay is probably larger than we think, because in many countries, uh, 80 to 90 percent of healthcare is uh, for the poor is provided by the private sector, so they do pay something. But can you provide the kind of quality services if you were doing healthcare? But even if it's integration into the uh, whether foundations will be paying, donors, the public sector, there is a budget constraint out there. And if you don't start targeting that budget constraint from the very beginning, you're going to be in trouble in terms of scaling up. The second is who's going to do this at scale? Who's going to implement this at scale? And what capable, I'm going to use the word capabilities a lot today. We'll talk about why I'm using that word in a minute. But the capabilities are um, to implement this model. Who's going to do that? And do they have those capabilities? Because often we design models or projects or programs that nobody at large scale has the capability to implement. And then we end up with something that either can't be done or has to be dumbed down or simplified quite substantially. And then we don't know if it's going to work. The third area that we want to avoid and why we need a strategy is you may prove that this works in five villages in Kenya or uh, 10 villages in India or um, somewhere in Latin America. But especially in a larger country like India or Brazil or Nigeria, but even in smaller countries, um, there's often diversity. There's a minimum of diversity between urban and rural. Uh, if, there, if you're in a country like Nigeria where you have you know, the, the Muslim North, which is very poor and uneducated, versus the Yoruba Southwest or the Igbo Southeast, those are like three different countries. And if you're planning to scale up across regions, provinces, states, knowing what are the key social, economic, cultural, and infrastructure differences and how they might affect the successful implementation of your model at scale is something you again want to start looking at from the very start or else you run into problems. And last but not least is um, increasingly there's an evidence, there's an emphasis on evidence-based policy making or evidence-based scaling up and a lot of the new strategic philanthropy and the venture philanthropy is very focused on randomized controlled trials, but they don't do uh, evidence-based and evaluations for scaling up. They do it just to show efficacy. And efficacy is fine, it's 
not only necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, and that's because largely scaling up is usually a political process. Even if it's, it's done through a social enterprise or through the market, stake various stakeholders, various partners, potentially foundations, the governments all have to be brought on board. And they may not be interested solely in the efficacy data that you're going to produce. They may have other agendas. And if you don't address those agendas up front, you're going to get into trouble. And just to give, not to focus too much on health, because that's, I think these are applicable to everything. But um, one example that I work with is a program in India that was doing adolescent sexual and reproductive health education in the schools uh, for teenagers, for the secondary schools. And by the time I was brought on to the project, um, the net effect of scaling up is that seven states in India had passed laws forbidding adolescent reproductive and sexual health education in the schools. And the reason when I asked was, well, they were afraid that it was going to encourage promiscuity. So I said, well, that's a simple problem to deal with. Um, what's your data show on increased sexual activity among participants? And they said, oh, that wasn't one of the outcomes of the study, so we didn't collect data on that. So from a pure efficacy model uh, approach, they had shown that they had increased the age of first conception, they increased the age of marriage, uh, decreased uh, increased child spacing, decreased SI, STIs and STDs and HIV infections. But that's not what the public cared about. That's not what the policymakers cared about. They cared about something different. And so uh, you want to talk to yourself and scale up by yourself, that's great. It doesn't usually get you very far. But if you actually want to engage the people who matter, then being sure that your, um, your evaluations and your monitoring generate the evidence you need for scaling up is essential. Okay. Have the next slide, please. So um, um, this is kind of a summary of the talk and some of the conclusions. And the first place I would start is set goals for scaling up early. So what is the maximum need or market? If you're doing this in country X in a few villages, or a district, or whatever the um, you know administrative breakdown is. If it works, what is the maximum scale? Is it only rural poor women who need it? Rural poor women of reproductive age? Uh, who is you know what does scale look like in terms of beneficiaries? In terms of location? Or if it's a social enterprise model, what's the market? How big is the market? Who is the market? You know, the second question you need to ask. It, so it is, it is both where and whom, and also what's the impact? Are you expecting to replicate the same impact at small scale or large scale? Often, as we move to scale, by definition, the organizations and people implementing at scale become average. Statistics 101, law of large numbers. You go from 100 people to a million people, not on the, on the beneficiary side or the client side or the market side, but on the delivery side, then it's not going to be charismatic PhDs from you know, Harvard or MIT or Berkeley or Stanford implementing this. It's going to be ordinary people working in bureaucracies and large-scale organizations. Can they do it? Because if they can't do it, you've got nothing. Okay? Identify the budget constraints and make sure that you're going to get affordability. Um, be clear on who will produce or deliver or distribute at scale, whether it's a nurse midwife or a um, local mom and pop shop, if it's a commodity. Uh, how are you going get to get this stuff out there? And, and does this fit with that pipeline? Okay, can so align the requirements of your model with the capabilities of what you expect to be the delivery system? even if that's you, even if you're talking about expanding your own activities. And being clear on, given where you're going to scale up and to whom you're going to scale up to, what are the differences in external social, cultural, and, and organizational factors, and figure out how you're going to integrate that, and I'll talk more about that, into your program uh, and, and your scaling up strategy. And last but not least, you can't design your evaluation strategy to produce data if you don't know who your key stakeholders are and uh, what their needs and interests and concerns are. 
And that actually comes out of this stuff, right? If you don't know who you're going to scale, if you don't know where the money's coming from, and if you don't know who may be the key uh, players at different social cultural levels, you can't decide, you don't know who the stakeholders are. So you, there's a reason for this sequence, because knowing your stakeholders is the product of who's going to scale it up and where you're going to scale it up to. Yeah, the next slide. Okay. So I just want to go over a few definitions, and I do hope that um, you will not be flummoxed, like this, uh, this one, uh, which is to be confused or complex. So the next slide. So uh, the first place I want to start is um, often in international development, particularly if you do public sector work or NGO work, as opposed to, but I think it's equally relevant for social enterprises, we conflate, the, we misuse the word capacity. Um, if you've done any work in this area, you probably have heard people talk about the term capacity building. But actually, capacity building is not used correctly. Okay, because if you look at the capacity of this cup, right, it's it's not about its you its ability, it's what it can do, it's about how big it is, right? So if this is a 12 ounce cup, we want to increase its capacity, we would go for a 32 ounce cup. Okay? When we talk about capacity building for organization. Um, we are actually meaning increasing its capability so that it can do things more effectively, but not more of them. There's a difference. And the reason I'm making this distinction between capabilities and capacities is because in scaling up, you need both. And if you only have one word, you're going to get into trouble. And so it's like nobody would believe that capability actually means capacity. So I have to actually revert to the original meanings. So it's scaling up, we want to make the cup bigger, but we want to make sure it still has the capability to hold water. The same thing with your organization or whoever's going to deliver this. There has to be the capacity to reach the scale, whether places, types of people, number of people, and the capability to effectively deliver the model at the same time. And this um, tends to be a, a tension or a trade-off in scaling up because often there are organizations like the public sector, a public health system, uh, education system, or even private sector delivery systems can reach lots of people, but do they have the capability of implementing the model or the program effectively? Conversely, you often have small NGOs that are very effective, but they can't reach thousands or millions of people. So how do you bridge that tension between capacity and capability? So that's why we're making that distinction, both because we need both, and also because we need to make sure that the organizations and delivery mechanisms we're using have both. Next slide, please. OK. So um, I'm going to, uh, there are lots of different definitions that I'm scouting up, but I'm going to focus on two today, just so we're all on the same page because I think it's important that we know what we're talking about on scaling up. I think most of the time, or at least a significant time, mostly we talk about program reach. So is it going to go to more places, um, or more people, or different demographics, like scaling up from, if it's a youth program, scaling up from 12 to 15 year olds to 12 to 20 year olds, could stay in the same place, right? Or could go to different places and stay with the same demographic. Or could stay in the same place, same demographic, but instead of covering 25% of the population, might go to 75% of the population. Okay? I hope it's obvious that these are not mutually exclusive. You could go to more places, expand your demographic targets, and also increase the coverage within those locations and groups. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. now the other definition though, that sometimes people get used is they talk about actually expanding the program itself to add more things to it. Okay, so I usually talk about breadth, depth, or quality. What I mean by breadth is, again, to stay with the health metaphor, since I know a lot of you are uh, MBH, uh, MBA students. The um, breadth, let's say it was a um, maternal health program, and the intervention was training 
uh, local uh, community health workers to do low antenatal visits in the village. And that was working and it brought down um, maternal mortality by whatever percent, okay? Well, we like the program, but we're going to expand it so that by the breadth, okay, by adding that they deliver micronutrients when they visit, okay, or other things where they do counseling to fathers so that fathers know how to be supportive, where they do counseling when they're doing the antenatal visits, they bring in the local nurse, uh, traditional birth attendant, TBA, or nurse midwife. Um, so that she can identify uh, and track people who are at high risk. So that would be adding things to the model. That's a form of scaling up. Okay? Or it could be depth. What I mean by that is, if we take the simple example of antenatal visits, well, maybe we start with two and we go to six. Okay? So that's a deeper version of the same thing. And last but not least is quality. You know, maybe initially the antenatal visits um, just sort of to have a five checklist, but we add to that. We add, you know, and we make sure that their uh, ability to diagnose and recognize at-risk women or high-risk pregnancies is much better. We go from a, you know, 50% threshold on the checklist to a 75 or 100%. So we improve the quality. We give them extra training. Uh, it's not to do anything different. It's just to do it better. Okay. Go to the next slide, please. So. Um, uh, I, I kind of just went through this. Um, the one uh, thing I didn't um, mention and I want to make sure that we cover is particularly for those of you in social enterprises. Um, um, somebody want to come in? No? Okay. Um, that where you are in the value chain uh, can also be a form of scaling up. So what I mean by that is particularly since uh, one of the major issues uh, that we confront today is rural poverty and most of those people are in agriculture, and many of them are farmers. Well, if you have a program that starts by helping farmers but then helps them move downstream into marketing, uh, processing, uh, post-processing, etc., etc., or move up the value chain into inputs and seeds and stuff like that, that would be a form of scaling up too. You could see it as a form of breadth, but I think it's, it's so important because value chains, whether we're talking about agricultural ones or, or small and medium-sized enterprises in whatever sector, um, is a really important way of scaling up as well. Okay? And I think, uh, next slide please. Yeah, I already covered all of this uh, in terms of reach, so. Alright, so if we put it all together, scaling up or going to scale, and I've used, chosen these words very carefully, is first of all, it's the process. So we're talking about how to go to scale, not what it looks like at scale. Secondly, so it's a process, not a product, okay? It's sustainable. So I'm using in my definition of scaling up sustainability because I don't think it's that interesting to go from 100 people to a million people and then two years later you got nothing, okay? Unless it's a particular type of program that will have all its impact in the first two years and then it just sort of lives happily ever after, okay? of a promising or proven innovation, I think both ethically, we would not want to scale up something that doesn't have evidence, and also it turned out to be harder to do, with fidelity and quality. So what does that mean? That means it's going to be similar, if not identical, to what we did at small scale, because that's what we know that works, okay? Thereby retaining some or all of its demonstrated positive impact. So why this last phrase? Because I cannot tell you how many programs I have seen go to scale that get really big and have lose all their impact. Okay, a uh, excellent example of that is a program um, in um, the uh, India called the Integrated uh, Child uh, Health Care uh, System. It's uh, delivered by Agadwadi workers of the village. It's supposed to be a, a nutritional supplementation that gives free hot meals to kids at lunch and it's had no impact on stunting, malnutrition, and all the things it's supposed to. 
Okay, and it's now in every village in the country. Oh, the next slide, I don't this. Okay, so we've talked about definitions. Now let's move to strategy. One more. So um, if you don't get anything else out of this talk, the 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 um, for those of you who are Jewish, you can pretend it's Passover, which is coming up in a couple weeks. Um, but these are the four questions, okay? that we ask at the Scaling Up Seder, okay? The first of the four questions is, what is being scaled up? And we can include with that, is are we expanding the scope, or what's the, what's the model? What's the program, model, intervention, innovation, I don't care what you call it, but what is the it? Um, you'd be astonished, and we'll come back to that, because that's a key point, that most people can't even tell you what their model is, or if you ask them what their model is, they don't know. I I've worked with a lot of groups. I'll take a group of 15 working in a social enterprise or an NGO, split them up into groups of five, and say, take 45 minutes and write down the 10 key elements of this model, and I never get the same list. Often, not even 50% of identical. Okay, so what does that tell you? Okay, where, we've talked about this, what are the goals? Presumably, it's to expand the reach. How are we going to do it? And who's going to fulfill the key roles of Who's going to, where the funding is going to come from, where's the managing going to come from, who's going to implement, produce, deliver, etc. Depending, and all of these will be relevant depending upon the nature of the of the thing itself. Next. Okay. So um, we talked about goals a little bit, but I just want to be really clear on what we mean by where, what reach, what impact. What time period? Is this something that should last indefinitely, or three to five years, five to ten years? <coughs> How much is it going to cost, and what's the coverage we're targeting? And I really put this in here particularly, even though it seems duplicative of this, because one of the most com a lot of this stuff that I put together is particularly designed to help you avoid pitfalls that are quite common. One of the most common pitfalls is the way that the easiest way to scale is to graft onto an existing distribution system. Okay, instead you don't have to build your own, which makes a lot of sense. That's why people do it. It's a great idea. The problem is that most existing distribution systems, particularly in developing countries, like I would dare say it's pretty much the same here too, tend to be much more effective at delivering especially if it's a social service or something like that, to people who least need it. In other words, if you look at the quality of schools and hospitals and clinics, whether it's in India or the United States, they're really good in affluent suburbs and really lousy in poor areas. Well, same thing true in India. Okay, so be explicit. Does scaling up include reaching those who are hard to reach? That's your choice. I'm not saying you know, you're a bad person and this is a lousy model if you don't do it. But don't pretend we're going national and then we're actually leaving out the 30% of the bottom of the barrel because we can't reach them. That should be an explicit decision, not a result of, of covering your eyes and pretending not to think about it. Next slide. OK. So there are four mechanisms for scaling up, and anybody who's really clever in this audience, and this is a really sharp audience, okay, will notice there are only three, so I'll have to guess what the fourth one is. So the first is expansion, and I think that's what many of you, particularly who are um, entering the uh, GSVC, will probably be thinking of is how do you grow your organization? But the way you're going to reach scale is by growing the organization itself. And that, and so, um, if you think about it, in my capability-capacity uh, dichotomy, okay, you have the capability, because you did the pilot, you know how to do it, and you're building the capacity and, and scaling up by, by building your organization. Okay? There are pluses to minus to that, and I'll come back to it. Okay? The second alternative is replication. Okay? Or sort of like cloning. I'm not sure how good an analogy that is. And in replication, um, you give the um, model, the program, the innovation to another organization. So this would be the classic example 
Um, if some NGO in some country or social enterprises does a great health or education or poverty program, and then it persuades the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Social Welfare or whatever it is to integrate it and deliver it large scale. Okay, that's the graph thing. It's a, it's a total handoff, and the the key differences here are. In this case, we start with capability, we build capacity. And in this case, the presumption is they have capacity and we're going to build capability. See why I wanted to make that distinction, why it's important? Um, and you can imagine, though, that, um, well, we'll come back to what the strengths and weaknesses are in these two, but they both have their pluses and minuses. And last but not least is collaboration with other organizations, which is basically you sort it out together. Okay, and I'll, I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, for those of you who are wondering what the fourth one is, is it, I would say it's actually there's a fourth and a fifth. The fifth is spontaneous, which if it happens by itself, then you don't need a strategy. But the fourth is virtual, which is you use the net, the web. Or something like that. And the reason I'm not including it up here is that that's only for a specific set of innovations where no touch work and no touch delivery works, right? But somebody can click on a website and do something. You know, education and training, certain types of education and training work, I wouldn't want to have online or however an early childhood development program, okay? Uh, for obvious reasons, I think. Okay, high touch necessary. Next slide. All right, so if we start to think about a strategy, a strategy needs, uh, or the process of scaling up is, first of all, we have to figure out, test what it is, and get evidence that it works. And I've talked about that the evidence for scaling up is much more um, multi-dimensional than simply does it work, but also where does it work, why does it work, where it works, um, etc. Uh, develop a strategy um, about are we going to use collaboration, are we going to use expansion, are we going to use replication, are we going to go through the government, through the private sector, our own delivery system. And depending upon what those choices are or who's going to fund it, then you can do advocacy. We've got to sell it, right? If we're going to sell it to the government, advocacy with the government. If we're going to sell it, expand ourselves, we've got to make sure our board of directors is on, on board. If we're going to partner with other organizations, we've got to sell it to them. So if you prefer the word marketing, it doesn't make a difference, but that's key. Um, once you do that, it's usually necessary to either build capability, if you're doing like replication, or build capacity, if you're expanding, or both. So that's the next phase. We implement, and then we ensure sustainability. Now, in a short talk like this today, I'm not going to get much beyond the first two or three, just because we don't have that much time and you're not at that level, but I can talk more if you'd like another time about these other points. Next slide, please. All right. So, um, before we uh, get into the strategy, I just want to talk about some of the challenges that come up in scaling up and how you deal with them. Can I have the next slide, uh, please? All right. So here are the major um, challenges, uh, at least our first set of challenges, you know, number one up here. We don't know what the model is. We ignore um, that we're going to go to new places that are different. We don't know what's required to implement our model, and we don't know how much it costs. You might think this is really stupid. But I was once asked to do a survey of 150 promising health innovations in, excuse me, India, and only three had cost him. Okay, so that can be pretty typical. Next slide. All right. So the place to answer these challenges, we it basically. And this is why I'm talking to you guys, because you guys are at the stage of designing your models and at, at an early level of implementation. You need to know what the it is, okay? When I work with groups and I ask them what their model is, almost all the time they tell me the technical content, whether it's a 
health model, they'll tell me the services or the goods or the commodities they're delivering. If it's an education model, they tell me the curriculum. If it's some sort of like a biogas generation model or something like this, they tell me about how they do that. But they never tell me about the implementation and delivery. Okay? So how is the curriculum delivered? How is the family plan commodities delivered? Does it go with counseling? Is the counseling where you treat a 16-year-old girl like crap so that she doesn't want to come back? Or is it warm and fuzzy and empowering and respectful? So, you know, particularly these issues of um, the uh, quality of care or, or delivery, and not just the, what's being delivered, are important. We'll come back to that next. We also want to know what the external environment is and what's likely to affect our outcomes, what capabilities are required to implement this, and how much does it cost. Okay? And particularly in the how much does it cost, we actually want to disaggregate that. Okay? Why is that? Because often when you go to scale, it you know, turns out that we prove that this works for $500 a person. And that's great when USAID is funding it at $100 a head, but we go to well, the Packard Foundation. But when you go to a million people, $500 a head makes $500 million, and nobody has that kind of money. Okay? So it turns out the budget constraint might be $100. And if you want to know how to go from 500 to 100, you need to say which components cost how much and what's their cost effectiveness. Because you may only end up with three of the 10 you started with. Okay. For example, Packard funded a model called Prachar, which is now in its third iteration, one, two, and three. I think it started out with four, six, or eight elements. It was uh, similar, actually, to the model I talked about before in the sense that, but it was uh, not a formal education model. It was doing informal education in villages, uh, particularly so that young women would learn about the risks of ch early childbirth and increasing the age of marriage and first conception, and it was successful. But they dramatically decreased the number of elements as they iterated on the model, and that's a very good example of how to do this. Next slide. So when you think about identifying the what, not only do you want to get what does it take, what the context is, and what's in it, but you particularly want to get all these other pieces. I love when I talk to someone and they say, oh, yeah, so we were working in this village, and this is what we were doing. And uh, we trained a bunch of local women, and they were delivering this stuff. And I said, well, how did you get permission to work in the, oh, well, we spent a year negotiating with village leaders uh, to do that. And, um, and, and so, would your model have worked if you didn't do that? The answer is usually no, because you wouldn't be there. So, getting permission and buy-in is actually as much a part of the model as the content, the technical content of what you're delivering. Similarly, if there's a whole bunch of training and capacity building and capability building, whether it's finding teachers, finding service providers, uh, getting people who run local kiosks to deliver condoms and how to do that properly. Uh, that's as much the preparation phase as well as the permission phase is as much as part of the model as the core of the model itself. I don't think I need to go into the technical elements because everybody knows what that is, but the tacit elements, the how, is what gets missed, what gets left out. So let's take an education model. Here's the curriculum that you teach, but how do you teach it? Okay, many, many new and cutting edge models are using a student-centered, experiential, bottom-up learning approach. Okay, but they're trying to often graft them onto education institutions that are top-down and teacher-oriented in culture. Okay, so being clear on this tacit stuff and what kind of culture and values and incentives it is and how it compares with what's out there, particularly in large-scale delivery systems, is absolutely key for successful scaling up. But you can't anticipate that problem and resolve it if you don't know what the how is. Right? So that's why identifying your model 
all this other stuff other than the part that you always talk about, right, which is that it's a great curriculum for a seven-year-old to learn math and English and, and um, the local language, uh, doesn't get you there. And then also, last but definitely not least, monitoring, supervising, and feedback. Um, this is a, uh, the most common form, but not the only form, of a bigger issue, which is incentives. Which is, why do beneficiaries um, participate, or clients, or, or buy your product or service? Why do service providers deliver it? Why do the managers agree to allow it into their institution? So there's a whole food chain, or delivery chain, of people who um, have to be on board in order to do this. Monitoring and supervising them is one sure way of ensuring quality, and uh, of, but that's not the only way. Okay? So being clear on these things, because often when you go to large scale systems, these things disappear. Right? It's one thing to monitor a project in three villages, it's another thing to monitor a project in 30 villages or 3,000 villages. All right. Uh, we're not getting that. First part. Okay. So um, these were the challenges, and I think I'm not going to read this because I went over it. But these are the solutions. If you don't know what the components are, do a uh, flowchart. Flowchart is my favorite. How do you actually do this for a logical framework? If you know what that is. Okay. If you don't know what capabilities are necessary, we'll take the activities in the model or the program and say, what would an organization need to know how to do or be able to do in order to deliver that? Because that actually will give you an assessment tool, for example, to look at potential partners or collaborators or whether or not the organization you want to graft it onto has what it takes. And if there's a gap there, it will also give you a capability building plan. We don't say, okay, we need A, B, C, D, E, and, and on a scale of 1 to 4, there are a 3 on A, and a 2 on B, and a 4 on C, so that tells us where we need to move the dot. Okay? And is that realistic? You know, what would that take? Um, obviously, if you can uh, figure out, and then I think this is the hardest one, which is figuring out what the external environment is. Uh, because when I ask organizations about this, it's like asking fish what kind of water they swim in. And it's only until they've moved to a new context and it doesn't work there. Um, for example, they move from urban to rural, and it turns out people don't show up because they're not going to walk two and a half hours to get to your program. Okay, So that can be uh, relevant. So one way to solve this problem is to try to implement it a few pilot levels in diverse locations. And I think the cost is pretty straightforward, but I really want to repeat this emphasis on the individual components so they, they can iterate until we get affordable and feasible um, products or services to deliver. Next. Okay. So I'm going to be running out of time here. Uh, so I just want to talk quickly about um, the fact that it's very common not to have a strategy. And let's talk about strategy, whether it's expansion or collaboration or what. Uh, the next slide. Um, one more. OK. So this is expansion, and we've talked about it before. And the key element here, when you can think about it as a sort of drawing your organization like this, it gets bigger, or sending out shoots, uh, like little babies, like the spider planet. And, and they, uh, that's more like a franchising model. The key issue here, uh, the plus and the minus, potentially, of expansion is control. You retain control of adoption and delivery. Next slide. By contrast, replication, OK, you don't have control. Once you graft it onto another delivery mechanism, it's gone, OK? And, but the advantage, as we talked about before, is that you uh, transfer capability to something that already has capacity. And that's very appealing, because you don't have to build capacity like you do in expansion. Next. Okay. And then there's collaboration. 
Uh, and there's lots of ways to collaborate, and I'm not going to go over all of them. But one is basically different organizations do different things. Like some will do training, some will do delivery, some will do monitoring. And they all have national or whatever the scale you're at capacity to do that. Uh, or you can achieve capacity. That's basically you start with um, capacity and you achieve capability by division of labor. Or the flip side, which is that you have a bunch of little organizations like NGOs that are all over the country. They can't achieve scale by themselves, but they all have the capability. Okay? So capacity and capability, once again. Next slide. All right. So um, I think I'm going to leave for you guys, or for the question and answer period as homework, um, what are the pluses and minuses of these different approaches? And I want you to think about it, particularly in terms of the scale on the one hand that you're going to, like is it the same or different, and whether your model is comprehensive, does it cover like the whole system that you're trying to change, or just partial? And is it a mostly technical intervention, or is it more process intensive? So if I could have the next slide. I got it. Okay. Um, let's just do one as an exercise, and the rest will be left as a reader uh, at home. Okay. Expansion, capability versus capacity, right? Well, the advantage of expansion is that you have capability, which, uh, and so you don't have to build it, but you have to build capacity. The advantage of replication is you have capacity, you don't have to build capability. Now, what kind of models would that make expansion or replication better for? Well, the more tacit, process-intensive, qualitative, intangible a model, the more difficult it is to build capacity. But if my model is, I'm scaling up an HIV vaccine, if God willing we ever have one, okay, teaching a whole bunch of other people how to get a shot is not that complicated. Okay, so the real challenge there is how to get it out to a million people. Okay, capability. The capability is easy, the capacity is the hard one. On the other hand, if this is a women's empowerment project, and it's got all these things that are going to kind of get your hands on about respect and empowerment and, and all um, gender equity and stuff like that. That's really hard to teach someone to do that. It's very labor intensive. It takes a lot of experience, a lot of practice to do. So you would think that an expansion of a, of a women's empowerment project might make more sense. And that's not the only consideration, whereas replication of an HIV vaccine might make more sense. Let's just do one other quickly, which is when is quality or control versus adaptability? Okay. So I think we already talked a little about the quality thing, which is actually even if you give an HIV vaccine poorly, it probably works. You know, you stick the needle in the wrong way or in the wrong place and it's painful. So what happens, you know? I mean the worst that happens is you get an infection. All right. Whereas if you don't deliver a woman's empowerment project with quality, you're in trouble. Okay, you get nothing. Okay. But a second aspect of this, so quality and control allow you to get fidelity. Right? You have control and expansion, you lose control and replication, and you're somewhere in between in collaboration because you've got to work with a lot of other people, but at least it's hands-on. Now, the flip side of this, though, is adaptability, which is that um, if I'm, let's, take, let's say we're in India, and I start something in the Delhi slums, okay, it seems to work, and then I want to expand to rural areas, I may not have the community relationship. I don't know the local terrain. I don't know that this is a Muslim neighborhood or a Hindu neighborhood or an upper caste or a lower caste or the difference between Rajasthan versus um, Karnataka or Bihar, okay? So having a partner or a collaborator that has local knowledge might be a big advantage when local knowledge will be important. When you're working with a model, which context makes a big difference. I think you're starting to get the flavor for how this works and how you can apply it to different models. Uh, if you have more time, we'll go through more. So I think, um, so I'll uh, keep going. So I just want to um, 
uh, uh, close with one uh, uh, last slide and then a few conclusions. The name of the game is putting all the pieces together. Okay, so we have, we've talked about what the model is, we've talked about where we're going to do it, we've talked about how is an expansion, replication, collaboration. We haven't really talked about, but we've kind of hinted about, we're talking government, we're talking NGOs, we're talking social enterprises, which are all viable. Okay, so how do we make sure that this all works? And that's the real challenge, because often what we get is we have a program that can achieve these uh, goals in terms of impact, okay, but do we have someone who can deliver this program at that scale with that impact, right? They may have the capability of delivering it, but they can't reach the scale. So we get impact but without scale, or they may have the capacity to achieve the scale, notice, capability, capacity, but they can't reach the impact. Okay? So what happens if you don't if the pieces don't align? Well, you have a few choices. One is you can do capacity and capability building, except that's a lot of work. It takes a lot of money. Okay? To do massive organizational change, especially if it's like getting a top-down bureaucratic hierarchical, medicalized, technically oriented institution or organization to move towards a bottom-up, grassroots, participatory, quality, emphasizing, egalitarian, yada, yada, yada. I mean, that's, that could take years. Okay. So I tend to discourage this one. So where does that leave you? Well, the easy way out is you just be more modest in your goals. You say, well, they're going to do a half-assed job of doing it, so we'll just cut our impact at 50%. You could do that. You could change the method. You could say, well, then we're just going to have, um, we're going to do a, a replication to NGOs instead of through the government. Yeah, we'll only reach 20% of the population, but it'll be with 100% impact. Versus maybe with the government, 80% of the population, 50% impact. So that's a trade-off you have to pick. Or you could simplify them all. Now, obviously, that will affect impact, but that's why you want to have disaggregated cost-effectiveness data. Because if you cut out a couple components or simplify them, you want to know how much of a drop in impact we're going to have, how it's going to affect my goals. So to summarize, um, our first set of conclusions is be clear what, what your goals are for scaling up. Where do you want to scale up? To whom? and with what impact, okay? Start at the end and work backwards. So if this goes to scale in this area, who would do it? Are we talking government, talking social enterprises, talking social marketing, etc. okay? Choose an appropriate mechanism of organization, um, uh, and, uh, excuse me, mechanism of scaling up, which is the most appropriate for this model. We started to go through why different uh, mechanisms are appropriate. Is it expansion? Is it replication? Is it collaboration? Or in your case, it might be virtual in a few cases. Okay? Uh, I think there's a tendency, particularly among social uh, entrepreneurs, to think expansion is the only way. We've got to grow our own system. But if you think about it, I mean, how many people innovate products in the United States and replicate supermarkets or set up their entire new distribution system? Well, a lot of this stuff comes out through existing distribution systems. And that's going to be as true in developing countries as well. And make sure that you allocate sufficient organizational and financial resources for going to scale. It takes as much to innovate, uh, to take something to scale, as it does to do it at, at a pilot level. I can promise you, I've done it both in time and money. Now our last slide is kind of a repetition of where we started. Since you're at the early stages of your project, I'd like you to really think hard about making sure that your monitoring, evaluation, and documentation are aligned with the needs of scaling up. So first of all, what are the invisible? Can you document that in these intangible and qualitative factors that make this work? Because I can guarantee you, if you don't document them and make sure they're part of your scaling up strategy, they will get dropped. They will get diffused. 
simplified, diluted, whatever you want to call it, but you know, the bigger the scale, the more chance you'll end up with none of that stuff and your model won't work, or your program won't work. Make sure, have you ever seen an evaluation that identifies the external environment? What were the external factors that made this model work in this place? I've never seen one. I've had thousands of evaluations, okay? That's why scaling up often doesn't succeed, because we don't know what external factors have affected the, the impact. And then when those external factors change, we don't know why it's not working. I mean, we kind of figure it out, but that's kind of ad hoc. You can save yourself a lot of time and aggravation by starting to think about that proactively. I think I've said it once, I've said it now 10 times in this talk, measure cost effectiveness of individual components so that we can make sure we can simplify this to be feasible in terms of delivery and affordable given budget constraints. And last but not least, given who's going to deliver at scale, what are the key stakeholders, what do they care about, and make sure we collect data on that. So I'm sure you've got lots of questions, but I hope this is a helpful start, and um, thank you very much. <laughs>